Three of the U.S.'s four biggest banks have now reported second quarter earnings, but the rest of the earnings season fireworks are yet to come. Strap in, folks, because this is where the money is. Matt, as you mentioned in the intro, three of the big, big four are, have reported second quarter earnings. Bank of America, the, the lone wolf that is still yet to report, reports tomorrow morning. What are you watching? Is it going to be anything unexpected, or is it business as usual, cleaning up, cleaning up costs and, and working through things? I, you know, I, I just I want to be clear with the way that I approach earnings season because it, it seems to be very different than the, the way the market, whatever we want to refer to as that, approaches earnings season because we've got these analyst estimates and if a, if a bank or any other company tops or misses earnings estimates, everybody's freaking out. They're either real happy that they... What I'm looking for is, is information. Mm -hmm. and, and with Bank of America, the information that I'm looking for Litigation has been such a has such a been such a big issue. Credit quality has been such a big issue. So I'm going to be looking for anything unexpected. The the, the litigation we know that the 8.5 billion dollar settlement with uh, Bank of New York Mellon, that's currently in the courts. They're hashing that out. I don't expect to hear anything additional from the earnings report from that. Um, I'm looking for anything else cropping up on the legal side. I'm also looking to see if the credit trends are continuing to move in the right direction. That means the, the percentage of non-performing loans, the charge-offs, uh, how much they're setting aside as, as provisions against bad loans. You know, we look at the reports from Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan, and Citigroup now. We're seeing provisions coming down as credit qualities are, are uh, trending, trending in the right direction as well. Mm -hmm. What you don't really want to see is those provisions coming down as the credit quality, the charge-offs, that sort of thing, as that moderates or, or starts moving in the wrong direction. How about you? Are you... Yeah, given that we've seen the first three report, I don't think we're going to be in for any surprises with Bank of America. I think we're going to see the wealth management business, and it's going to continue to do well, kind of just chug along. I think the trading business will have a good, good quarter, as we saw Goldman had a good quarter this quarter, Citigroup had a good quarter, J.P. Morgan had a good quarter. So... If Bank of America doesn't have a good trading quarter, maybe that's a little bit of concern, but I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, the consumer business, it's going to be sluggish. It's been sluggish. There's not a lot of consumer loan demand out there. Even though it's not a huge part of Bank of America's business, I'm going to be watching what they did with mortgage, not that old legacy countrywide mortgages. Talk about new mortgages, so refinancing activity. You want to see them conducting new business? New business. You're getting a imagine, crazy now. imagine that. You're getting a little uh, crazy. So when we think back to the crisis, Bank of America Countrywide, obviously hugely in the mortgage business. Right when the mortgage business crashed, they got out of that to a large extent. They really scaled back. They scaled back right when they should have been making good loans, right when credit-worthy customers were coming in asking for mortgages, and they weren't really ready for that. So I want to see, did they pivot? Are they now able to handle the capacity of new people coming in to buy homes, to refinance homes? It'll be really interesting to see if they do that. And we'll also see that compared to U.S. Bancorp, also reports tomorrow. Behind J.P. Morgan Wells Fargo, Bank of America, U.S. Bancorp, those, that's the next tier in mortgage origination. So are they chipping away at that market share that's really been dominated by those two players? And hopefully Bank of America can do it. I mean, they've scaled back. Maybe ba Bank of America and Brian Moynihan, have, they've turned the switch, and it'll be guns blazing now. We'll see. Are, are you getting a little bit more bullish these days? Uh, I would, if if they show in the quarter that they've really made progress, we looked at first quarter, 91% of the mortgage originations were refinance activity. When refinancing falls, that's going to pull it down a fair amount. So I'd really like to them to see people actually purchasing homes, them creating those relationships. That's what's crucial to Bank of America. Now, when it, the one other thing that I'd be remiss not to bring up on Bank of America since it's been such a big issue for me this quarter is the balance sheet, the, the, the unrealized gains, the, the debt portfolio. Uh, what we've seen over the past quarter is interest rates have gone way up. This, this plays into what you're just talking about, the, the mortgage business. Mm -hmm. But the other, the other impact that this creates is that the prices on the fixed income securities in their debt portfolio, they fall. Mm -hmm. And what we saw at J.P. Morgan, what we saw at Wells Fargo, what we saw at Citigroup is billion-dollar losses, unrealized losses on the balance sheet. And the reason that this is a big deal for investors is, again, we're valuing these banks as a multiple on book value. So you look at the profits that these banks earned in the second quarter, and the, the change in book value from first quarter to second quarter wasn't nearly as big as those profits because of the accounting for those big mm -hmm. multi-billion dollar unrealized losses. So I'll be looking at Bank of America's balance sheet to see how their losses compare to everybody else. It's not a question of if they had losses on their, on their uh, debt the magnitude. Portfolio. Yeah, it's the magnitude. And, and 
whether whether their earnings power was able to offset that. Great. Now, during earnings season, obviously, it's not just the big banks that mm -hmm. that are reporting earnings or that we're we're concerned about. You know, I think that there are some investment opportunities beyond the big banks. And this week, we're going to get to see some earnings reports from some of the smaller banks as well. What are a few that are on your radar? Yeah, well, we talk about the mortgage business, the consumer business. That's a big focus, and a lot of consumers can identify that with that. But when we look at a bank like Huntington Bank Shares or Key Corp, they're a little bit more focused on business lending, business banking, and making commercial loans. So it'll be interesting when they report. Just what what's the trend there? Are, are they seeing demand in the commercial space with interest rates still so low? Are our businesses still being very conservative, still hoarding deposits, and not? not taking out loans from from a bank like Huntington or Key Corp. So it'll be interesting to see what are the just what are the the trends? What are their comments around? What are they hearing from their business clients? Not as much the mortgage banking where, where Key Corp isn't a huge player in originating mortgages. It'll be more interesting to see what are they hearing from their business clients. Mm -hmm. Now, like I said with the with the bigger banks, what I look for in earnings season is is information. And I'm a I'm a shareholder in PNC, uh, not in in Key Corp or Huntington, but I'll be I'll be looking at those as well. But with all three of the banks, again, I'm going to be looking for information and what we know is we know the economic factors that have sort of changed over this uh, over this quarter period. We we know the how the interest rate environment has changed. We now know at least three of the four big banks how they performed and, and some of the trends we've been seeing there. Uh, credit quality has been improving there. Uh, loan growth has been very sluggish. Mm -hmm. Core operations have been not wa really wowing. Uh, a lot of what's been offsetting are, are trading operations and, and fee-based businesses. We've seen the losses on, on the, the balance sheet, on the, the debt portfolios. So I'm going to be looking at a lot of these factors as these smaller banks report and see how they stack up, how they were able to manage this versus the bigger banks. Uh, you know, in some ways, uh, people look towards the bigger banks as, well, they've got less of these dangerous businesses than the big banks, so obviously they're safer. But when you when you run into an environment like this, sometimes having that more diversified business can be an advantage. And mm -hmm. you know, again, uh, we're going to talk about Goldman Sachs in a little bit, and we saw uh, strength in trading there. We saw strength in trading at, at J.P. Morgan, and this can offset some of the weaknesses elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, whether that's going to be an issue at the smaller banks, I don't know. But we'll get to see how how they held up with these with these economic and interest rate changes mm -hmm. versus the bigger banks. And I think it's interesting you mentioned PNC. The one factor that differentiates them from a key corporate Huntington is their stake in BlackRock. That, a lot of that gets overlooked. They own around, I think, 21% of BlackRock, and that's been an investment for, I think, 18 years or something like that. And they've sold off some of it. They've almost doubled uh, their initial investment, I think. So it's been a very fruitful relationship to have that stake in BlackRock. So it'll also be interesting to see what are their comments around that. It's basically like a long-term long investor having a, a stock holding. You have a great gain. What do you do with that capital? Do you, do you sell that stake, deploy that back to your shareholders, or do you keep, keep holding it? I mean, that contributes, I think it's around 13% of their, re or their net income comes from that stake in BlackRock. So it's a pretty significant part of their business. It'll be interesting to see what they say around that. That's a great point. Now, I, I started out by saying that, that three of the four big banks have reported now. One of them just yesterday, Citigroup. Results look good to me. Uh, you know, I, I was looking at the, the I mean, the, the story with Citigroup, right, is, is the, the geographic strength. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the bank is all over the place, all over the globe. I mean, the, the, other, the other investment banks, they have operate, some operations in other countries, I, mean, I guess with the exception of Wells Fargo, mm -hmm. really nothing there. But Citigroup, its strategy, its big picture, and for investors, really the story to look towards is the global diversification. And 49% uh, of, of net income or, net, or profit uh, during the quarter was from emerging markets. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a big part of the story. That's a big part of the strength. It's also potentially part of the concern. I mean, we're hearing a lot of stories about China potentially having a hiccup and slowing down. I would certainly be be a concern if I was a Citigroup investor. Yeah, and you talk about just what's the story? Why would someone buy Citigroup today as opposed to a year ago? The story was this bank is cheap on a on a multiple basis from a price to tangible book or price to book value. You're not going to try to tell me it's not cheap today. You could argue that it's it's certainly not as cheap today <laughs> on a multiple basis. So I think the story shifted a little bit from it's really cheap to now I think more the narrative is it's such a global bank. It has great exposure to all these markets. But that gives me a little bit of a pause. I was reading the transcript of the earnings call last night, and 
they just have their hands in so many different operations. A lot of consumer exposure in Latin America and Mexico, Mexico home builders, uh, securities and banking exposure to Asia, the U.S. consumers. So it just seems like my concern is they may be spread too thin if a crisis pops up in, the, in Mexican housing. Mm -hmm. That's not going to necessarily affect Wells Fargo. But Citigroup has fairly significant exposure to the Mexican housing market. So does that give you s some pause at all that just they don't have, they have more, more things can go wrong in their operations per se? Uh, that's, Potentially. That, that's relatively that's a relatively fair thing to say. I mean, one of my knocks against Citigroup has always been there doesn't seem to be a cohesiveness to the whole unit. You know, here's what we are and here's how everything interacts. Here's how the pieces fit together. I feel like we have that a lot more at some of the other, uh, particularly the bigger banks. I mean, at the smaller banks, you don't have to worry about it mm -hmm. as much, right? Because there, are, there aren't that many different operations. They, they are what they are. With the bigger banks, they have all of these operating pieces, and it's a question of how they fit together. One of the things I've always liked about the uh, Bank of America story is I feel like the pieces fit together really well. You have kind of this, this seamless knitting together of uh, having all of these different business units that can cross-sell to each other, that can feed customers into different parts of the business. With Citigroup, I was, I'm not really sure that that's there, and I still have that concern. But I do, I'm getting more and more of the sense of having a cohesiveness around being this global bank, having this global presence. Mm -hmm. And, and I, th I think there are a lot of investors that are, kinda, that, are, that are in your camp, and I was in this camp, and I'm slowly moving out of it, of why, why would I invest in Citigroup? You, know, you look at the, the valuation, it's not as cheap as it was before. It's still selling at a, at a small discount to tangible book value. Mm -hmm. And as we always say, if you look to pre-crisis uh, book value multiples, we, I don't think we should expect to see the banks trading at those again. However, when we think about you know, broad historical multiples and we think about what, what's probably a fair multiple for the banks, a dis I don't think a discount to, mm -hmm. to tangible book value is it. Mm -hmm. So I think, and, and another, another big story at Citigroup is the, the capital levels. I mean, Citigroup has built up such a huge capital reserve, it's you know, day and night between what it was pre-crisis versus what it was now. I think the the company, the, the bank, and the stock to, to the, a similar extent is kind of sneaking up on investors, mm -hmm. and and I you know I, I'm keeping a closer eye on it because I think they're making a lot of a lot of nice moves, and uh, and I'm more impressed than I was in the past. Great. Moving on to a bank that's not as much a, a you know doesn't have as many mortgage concerns because it's not really a consumer bank it's Goldman Sachs it's you know it's the investment bank mm -hmm. it's the the trading bank uh, reported earnings this morning they look like as as you described them to me what you'd expect from Goldman mm -hmm. Sachs right yeah I, th I think that's how you have to look at Goldman Sachs during good times during times of low market volatility or I guess you could say we had high market volatility in the interest rate environment in the second quarter but generally, the economic environment right now is pretty tame. Volatility is pretty low from a historical perspective. And I think you have to expect Goldman Sachs, they're going to perform well when times are good. The question is about investment banks and a bank like Goldman Sachs is, when times get a little hairy, are they going to be able to fight through that? Mm -hmm. My confidence is with Goldman Sachs that they will be able to manage through that. I think they certainly learned some lessons during the financial crisis. I think most banks did. So during these good times, I think you're going to continue to see Goldman I think, Sachs. I think one of the lessons they learned is how awesome Goldman Sachs is, <laughs> yeah, to I, be fair. That's basically what it is. So I think you're going to continue to see them perform well, uh, position themselves to take advantage of global growth. So I'm confident Goldman Sachs, crises are going to happen, volatility is going to come. So the stock price might get dinged during certain market times. But over the long run, I think Goldman Sachs is positioned nicely to take advantage of multiple different trends that are going in their direction. What do you think? I, I, I agree with... with basically everything you had to say. When I look at the results, and one of my, one of my concerns and one of, the, one of the things that holds me back, I am a Gold, Goldman shareholder, but when you look at the breakdown of the, of the earnings and you think about the, the quality of the different streams of earnings, you've got the, the true investment banking piece, which is sort of the advisory part of mm -hmm. it. This is the you know, advising on mergers and acquisitions where Goldman excels globally. Gold, Goldman is the gold standard mm -hmm. when it comes to that, but it's also raising money through IPOs, raising money through debt. That is a, I would call that a relatively high quality stream of earnings. It's, uh, it's cyclical. It's, it's not something that you can count on be, being the same from quarter to quarter. These, these things uh, uh, have their ups and downs. 
but it's not the kind of thing that's going to bankrupt you. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's the kind of business that you can count on as well. I'm uh, extremely confident that today companies need advice in order to merge and make acquisitions. And 20 years down the road, I believe companies will still be paying good money for, for advice on mergers and acquisitions. Asset management is another, I think, high quality, is a high quality um, earning stream mm -hmm. that Goldman Sachs has. That's way more stable. Mm -hmm. um, and so you've got those two kind of bookending this giant trading operation in the middle. And I think to, to, to some extent, it's less of a proprietary flavor than maybe it was mm -hmm. in, in terms of risking, uh, risking the bank's own capital on directional bets. But still, it's a, it's a very opaque uh, earning stream. Mm -hmm. It's a, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think investors can really get their head around, well, what can we expect this quarter? Right. Um, I, th well, I think that's an interesting point, though. You say investors can't say, what should we expect this quarter? And that might create some uncertainty or some instability around the stock price at times. I think that's when you can take advantage of a cyclical business like Goldman. You mentioned the investment banking. It's a little cyclical. Mm -hmm. goes through its ups and downs. Same with the trading business. There can be a lot of market overreactions, but I think you, you t talked about the 20 years out. I think these businesses are still going to be around 20 years out. I, I, I think they are, but when you think about the, the kind of regulations that, that uh, the government is talking about, it, it's a question mark. And also when you just think about the, the development of markets. Now, one of the things Goldman Sachs has proven itself uh, adept at is when, when markets change, when businesses change, they find new ways to generate income. But markets continue to change. I mean, if you think back uh, a couple decades, uh, a couple decades prior, trading equities was was still you could make a, a legitimate amount of money trading trading equities. Uh, but today, uh, thanks to to computer trading, thanks to lower commissions, that's not really a good business. Mm -hmm. So so when we talk about Goldman's uh, trading profits, we're not really talking very much at all about trading cash equities like you you or I would mm -hmm. be would be trading. So there will be changes in that business. And when I, when I have concerns about the, the opacity and the, the non-reliability of, of the business, I think about it more from the perspective that I don't feel the market will ever put a very high multiple on that earning stream. So when we think about the different parts of Goldman Sachs business, you're going you're gonna to find the market being willing to value a business more that it can count on, that it knows what it's that it knows what it's going to get in terms of earning. Now, a trading business may be a good one; it may spit out a lot of earnings. But if you can't really see inside of it, and you don't really know what you're going to get from from quarter to quarter or year to year, then it's going to be tough to to argue that the market should be providing a, a higher multiple. So, so you said you're a shareholder. I am as well. Are you confident that they will be able to to stay ahead of of tra changing trends and becoming still the leading? market standard in whatever the next trading product is. You mentioned just trading cash equities. In the early 80s, I don't think a lot of people saw uh, CDO, CDO squared, it's all that structured uh, trading happening. Goldman was on top of that. They became market leaders in that. Who knows what the, the trading products are going to be in 10, 15 years, I'm sure. I don't think you're going to uh, deny the fact that there'll probably be, will be new trading products that some, someone on Wall Street will think of, a new way to get credit flowing. I'm confident that Goldman's going to be a leader in whatever the trading product is. Are you confident long term? Well, I'm, a, I'm a shareholder, right? <laughs> now, you know, when, when I look at it, it's, it's, a, it's a intellectual business. It's a, it's a people-driven business. So as long as it looks like Goldman is still getting the best people, still has the best brands, still is seen as the, uh, has the intellectual horsepower that, that beats out uh, many of the other major investment banks, you know, I, I'm confident that they will adapt to to changing circumstances. That doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm perfectly confident in what we're getting out of that out of that big trading operation. But it does mean that that I think that they'll be able to adapt. And you know, between here and here, I'll get you know I'll get a good stream of earnings. But I don't know what's going to happen in here. Okay, fair enough. <clears throat> Finishing out with with a little with a little bit of fun here. Bank of America. Lots of lots of litigation. One of the more recent cases that that hit the news wires was there. Were, there was a handful of former Bank of America employees. There, I, I believe, five Bank of America employees and, and a contractor, a former contractor, that were saying that Bank of America was intentionally holding up uh, government HAMP 
uh, home modifications, mm -hmm. uh, home mortgage modifications. And the reason that they were doing that is they, they could get more fees by doing this. Maybe they were overburdened. But in any case, they were essentially lying to homeowners and rejecting people that otherwise should have qualified for these, uh, for these modifications. Scathing. <laughs> Indeed. So Bank of America, and, and I've got a Bloomberg article up here. So Bank of America came, came back. I've, I've been waiting to see what they had to say about this. And they essentially said that their employees were, uh, those employees were full of it. Uh, they said that the, the employees' wild misrepresentations about their roles lead to impossible claims about what they didn't saw. Uh, they could not have witnessed what they claimed to have witnessed because they were not in a position to do so and would not have witnessed such things in any event because Bank of America's actual practices were diametrically opposed. <laughs> diametrically Shocker. opposed. Shocker. Yeah. So given, given what, what Bank of America has been through and given the perceptions of Bank of America, and you know, for anybody watching that, that, doesn't, that doesn't know about that, the perceptions of Bank of America are terrible. So I think a lot of people would read this and say, well, obviously Bank of America isn't going to come out and, and defend itself and throw its employees under the bus. The employees have to be telling the, telling the truth. Mm -hmm. The employees are probably telling the truth. And that's entirely possible. That's entirely possible that the employees are telling the truth and Bank of America is, in fact, full of it. But just to have a little bit of fun, Bank of America has 263,000 employees, give or take. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of employees. And so we're talking about five or six former employees out of 263,000. That's well below 1% mm -hmm. that, are, that are basically stepping forward and saying Bank of America did, did this. So I was thinking to myself, what are, the, what are the crazy things that Bank of America employees might, be, might believe mm -hmm. if they were put on the stand and asked, do you believe this? And there was an interesting poll earlier this year from the Public Policy Polling Institute. Okay. And here are a couple of the interesting results. Uh, one of the questions was, uh, do you believe that Lee Harvey Oswald, and this, th I, sh I should say, this uh, poll went out to about 12 or 1,300 registered voters in America. Okay. So do you believe that Lee Harvey Os Oswald acted alone in killing President Kennedy, or is there some larger conspiracy at work? 51% of the respondents said that they believe that there's a larger conspiracy at work. And you know, if you've ever seen JFK, <laughs> Maybe, uh, you know, maybe you're on board with that. 14% of the respondents said that they believe in Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Um, let's see. 15% said that they believe the media or the government adds secret mind-controlling technology to television, uh, to television broadcasting stations. That's us, Matt. We're the media. Apparently. <laughs> now, here's, here's my favorite. This is, this is my very favorite. Do you believe that shape-shifting reptilian people control our world by taking on human form and gaining political power to manipulate societies? 4% of the respondents to this poll said they do believe in that. I was one of them. <laughs> I bet you were. Now, if we take that and, and we, we assume that of the 263,000 employees working at Bank of America that it holds for them, that means that there are roughly 10,500 employees at Bank of America <laughs> That you could put on the stand and say, do you believe that lizard people shapeshift into human form and are controlling our society? And they would say, yes, I do believe that. So, you know, I'm not going to say that Bank of America is right or wrong, that those former employees are right or wrong. But to think that five employees of 263,000 might say something that's not true when we think that maybe 10 or 11,000 of those employees believe in shapeshifting uh, shape-shifting li lizards. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm willing to let this go. Go to the facts. Go to the trial, and, and let that decide. Let the you know dig up the documents, find out what's really going on mm -hmm. before we throw Bank of America under the bus and say, obviously they're in the wrong. All about perspective. <laughs> For David Hansen, I'm Matt Koppenheffer. Thanks for watching, folks. We'll see you tomorrow.